April 8th, 2016. Welcome to my analysis of Newton and what I'm calling the cult of Newton. Most of us in school are presented with Newton's laws of thermodynamics and we don't really look at what a law is. So what is it? There are two types. There is the law of what is and the law of what ought to be. These are based on two kinds of knowledge, what are called a priori and a posteriori. Doing away with traditional definitions, I'll have you use a working one. Think of it as prior and post. Knowledge you can have prior to observation and knowledge you can have after observation. For example, internal reflections, axioms of math, definitions like all unmarried men are bachelors or I think, therefore I am. There's nothing that you have to observe on earth or elsewhere. It can all be contained within the mind. A posteriori knowledge is things that you have to observe, like the fact that planets move or don't. One way or the other, it's something that has to be observable and confirmed. So here's where the confusion sets in. We use a posteriori knowledge to reach a priori knowledge frequently. That is, we may observe something to be true so much of the time that it helps us develop an abstract principle that we can say is true all of the time. And in a battle of what is and isn't true, a priori knowledge wins over a posteriori knowledge. And because of this, we have to be very careful about what we include in our a priori knowledge. Because this is the set of knowledge we use to determine what we are correctly and incorrectly perceiving, that is, what enters our a posteriori knowledge. In determining which of two competing theories in physics is correct, we'll defer to the one that has better a posteriori knowledge that is, is more consistent with what we can observe. Or, if a theory is shown to have violated a logical law or law in mathematics, both a priori points of knowledge, that would be fatal to the theory regardless of any observable phenomenon. Most of us check out mentally when we hear discussions about competing theories of modern physics. And that's because we don't have enough a posteriori knowledge to make the determination one way or the other. What I'd like to do here is bring in more people into the discussion by using points of internal logic, showing whether one theory or another is internally consistent, because this relies on a priori knowledge and is no less valid, in fact is superior, to points of a posteriori knowledge. Physics is something that all of us can participate in. It's something that ought to make sense and should be consistent. And that's what I hope to be able to show you today. In Newton's physics, he presents an idea that force is equal to mass times acceleration. That is, this concept of force is something that we can measure, and it depends on how big something is and how quickly its velocity is changing. Newton named an internal resistance to movement as a property of mass, and he called it inertia. So the resistance to movement of a large or more massive object would have more inertia. And inertia is not considered a force per se, and I'll get into that a little more later. For now, we can understand inertia simply as the property of mass that causes it to want to continue in its present trajectory. So this would be part of Newton's formulation that an object not subjected to any forces tends to continue at its present velocity in a straight line. As a related concept, inertia times velocity is what in Newtonian physics is called momentum. But let's put all of the labels aside for a second and just go back to some common sense here. Before I go further, I should say that I endorse neither a geocentric or heliocentric model of the world. I am simply using what is now conventional knowledge in conventional physics to show that internally it's inconsistent. The natural question is, why isn't somebody sitting where alpha is, having less weight or flying off of the earth as compared to somebody where beta is at one of the poles? probably get a very complicated answer about that. What it boils down to is the assertion that what you feel is not a force moving to the outside, that is centrifugal force is supposedly a fictitious force, 
and that what you really feel is inertia, the tendency to continue moving along the straight line where you were. Spin a ball in a circle, remove the circle, and the ball continues traveling on a straight line. That's the supposed proof for why what you feel is actually inertia toward the tangent on which you were traveling. The sharp turn you take in a car is supposedly the force you feel along the tangent of the circle of the arc on which you're traveling. So there is no centrifugal force as it were. Newtonian mechanics says that centrifugal force is fictitious. It does not exist. There is no force moving to the outside of a circle. And before I ask this next question, remember that inertia is not a force. It is a mere property of mass. Why is it that if there is no force exerting upon the earth or the mountains or the people along the equator that we have an equatorial bulge? Why is it that any mass has an equatorial bulge when it's spinning? I don't think this question has been answered to anyone's satisfaction. The best one I could come up with was saying that the inertia kept the mass along the tangent point somewhere just above the surface of the earth or the circle drawn by the outside perimeter of the earth. But let's pretend that somehow there was an explanation using momentum of inertia as the reason why we have an equatorial bulge. As we recall, momentum is defined as the inertia of a mass times its velocity or its speed. So there's this ride called the Gravitron and it's a fast spinning circle and it pins you against the wall with its force and then the floor drops out. I was watching these guys stand up in the Gravitron. But in order to do that, the force acting upon them would have to be pushing them directly out of the circle and not along a tangent line. Otherwise, we would expect to see them tumble against the direction in which the Gravitron was traveling. Let's suppose also that the momentum and inertia is used to explain why this has an effect on the Earth shifting some 26 miles of Earth material outward while having zero effect of the weight of a person at the equator as opposed to one at one of the poles. There's no need to quibble about the terminology of what is a force or what is inertial force. All we have to do is know that there's the phenomenon of matter, mass, being moved outward from the center of a spinning point such that a planet or a sun or anything would have an equatorial bulge. Well, a point on the sun's equator travels at about four and a half times the speed of a point on the earth's equator. And the mass is gigantic when compared to the earth, coming in at about 333,000 times the mass of the earth. So whatever explanation was provided for the equatorial bulge of earth being there, we would expect to see the same in the sun, only even more so, quite a bit more so. So what is the equatorial bulge of the sun? Well, taking the margin of error out as caused potentially by instruments, the sun has an equatorial bulge of zero, none, nothing. It is the most perfect sphere that we have ever recorded in space. Keep in mind also that the sun oscillates several kilometers every few days in size. We've been trying to detect any kind of abnormality in curvature for over 50 years and we've blamed the atmosphere for blocking us from doing so. So we went into space to do it, and we found that it has no equatorial bulge, despite its mass, despite its velocity. The reason I call it the cult of Newton is because we've had astronomers and physicists scrambling to save their conception of what is an a posteriori fact, the law of gravity and classical mechanics. We've heard things like, well, it's made out of a gas, and, well, maybe parts of it are moving faster than others, and maybe it's rotating altogether slower than we thought. None of them are satisfactory because a critical component of Newtonian physics is that we measure the center of mass. And even if we didn't, even looking at what a gas might do in rotation as compared to a solid, it doesn't take into account the fact that Jupiter, also a gaseous planet, 
has a 7% equatorial bulge at about 10% the mass of the Sun. What does this all mean that we've shown this inconsistency internally within the system? Well, it means we have to rethink everything that we know about physics. Because we use a priori knowledge in doing so, attempts to refute it using a posteriori knowledge are futile. It doesn't matter that we've built buildings or designed things that work because of our concept of Newtonian mechanics. It simply means that there is something else out there, a better way, a better system to describe what we're all living in. To me, it means that gravity, as we've been taught, doesn't exist. This doesn't mean that oranges and apples stop falling to the earth. It simply means that this phenomenon that we all observe is not best described by the system of gravity. There is something else out there. And before I go, here's a quick poem by an Indian poet that is rather inspiring. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words flow from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my world awake.